And actually, these are standard ideas. Um, uh, standard ideas in uh, statistical pattern recognition, which we introduce them back actually in uh, the setting of uh, neural networks and are extremely um, uh, uh, now become very popular and they sound that very efficient. Sorry. So, I mean, this is the standard idea of uh, the art phase version one. So you have the normalized features that you see in uh, on the left hand side, you normalize also the weights of the softmax classifier, which are kind of droids. And then you put a margin between, between your um, features and, um, and uh, the sedroid when we're talking, uh, of course, um, for the, the classes that are the, all the other classes that do not belong to this particular, that this particular feature does not belong. And this way you, not only, as I said before, you not only you make the um, uh, the center of the class, the, the variance within the class small, but you allow the classes to be, let's say, within the margin far away uh, uh, as possible. And this is the idea of the ver arc phase version two. What we did is we split the um, the the weights in the soft max. Instead of having only one weight per class, one weight vector per class, we have various weight vectors per class. Uh, which call them subsetters, and as the network progresses, actually this collapses to, to the major uh, the subclass on the class. Um, actually, we did a lot of experiments on this, and the most important experiments we did was the phase recognition uh, test in uh, the FRVT phase verification um, uh, challenge. The FRVT, it is the standard actually challenge for the industry for face recognition. Actually, face recognition now is not anymore just uh, as it was used to be like 10, 15 years ago. It was just an academic topic. Now you see the application of face recognition in everyday's life. You see in iPhones, you see it in, um, in many, many different situations. Here in the UK, we have it uh, for, um, for um, um, uh, working with, for example, with the home office all the time your identity is verified using face recognition. And with uh, the previous architecture I have shown you, and of course some other tricks I will discuss later of how to generate samples, we have uh, managed to beat the state of the art, not only the academic one, but also the industrial, the industrial world. So in the, in the wild um, challenge, which is the most challenging one, we managed to be the first in the world uh, and the code is publicly available so people can use it. And um, with this, we have shown that um, uh, you don't need actually to, uh, to gather so many results as standard and particular Chinese companies are doing, but you can be clever uh, and develop um, new algorithms which actually can compete uh, uh, worldwide. So the phase recognition for me is not only, is not mainly for uh, for creating phase recognition applications, which is application generally I do not have, but for me, the phase recognition um, 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 development of phase recognition algorithms are very challenging for two tasks. One, it is, I believe, the most important fine grain, let's say, um, classification topic. So you have so many classes and you want to classify between them. So you take the classification paradigm to the end. So to extremes and in the extremes, when you look in the extremes, this is where the breakthrough may happen. And the second is because I believe by having a very good networks that do phase recognition that to classify humans can, um, can be used as very efficient and very good features for driving algorithms, a particular algorithm for generating uh, images. So this is take this, the phase recognition network is going to be using to drive phase recognition algorithms. Before going into that, phase reconstruction algorithms. I will talk a little bit about uh, our work on 3D phase reconstruction, which is very important for synthesizing results. So the past few years, we have been doing very large scale collections of uh, 3D phases. Recently we did also for bodies. We have collected a very large database of around 5,000 people with uh, different expressions. What you see here is some, some examples of this database and some, the corresponding UV maps of this data, database when we put them in correspondence. Using this database, we have created large scale statistical models. Actually, this is a statistical model from a previous work of ours where we have collected 10,000 people 3D 
Um, this database, this model here is publicly available for use. Um, it's called the LSFM model. And this is sampling from the LSFM model. You can create uh, arbitrary people. You can create different actual ethnicities and different uh, age groups and different uh, uh, gender variations. Uh, the important thing about the new database that we have collected is uh, that we have uh, managed to uh, generate, to create a generative model, actually GAN, on the UV map. So these are um, uh, random samples created from our generative adversarial network uh, trained on UV maps. This is thanks to the breakthroughs that happened from NVIDIA. Uh, creating what they're called um, progressive guns, then style gun one and then style gun two. And this is uh, some by using a modified style gun that uh, we have uh, properly modified. And um, the nice thing about having uh, images and correspondences is that your generator can very nicely produce various um, um, uh, results rather than having it in, um, in the original domain where the gun inevitable because inevitably because the none of the 3D structure of the human face is going, as we'll see, is going to create uh, samples that are not uh, fall exactly in the manifold of the 3D face. Uh, this is an example to show you actually why the GAN is important here for modeling the texture. If, you, if we use PCA, which is a standard paradigm for modeling texture before, you see on uh, the lower uh, side here that only the low frequency uh, of the face is preserved. While with a gun, you can preserve the high frequency details, which are very important for constructing um, uh, the texture of a human face. And this is um, a, a major breakthrough that happened in our my group um, and one and a half years ago, what we call um, a gun fit. The gun fit is an analysis by synthesis 3D phase reconstruction method. It uses a PCA model for the shape. It uses a PCA model for the expression for modeling the 3D expression. And in uses in order to, to create the, to model the texture of the face is using a gun. Then we have a differentiable renderer where we take parameters, we can take samples from the shape, the, the expression and identity, as well as the texture of the, of the gun. We create a face and then using the differential renderer, as you see on the third row, sorry, third column, you, we render the face and then we use the distance between the input image and the render face to drive the analysis by synthesis method using, for example, optimize using um, um, uh, um, Newton or other methods, or you, you can use even the standard um, optimization method that are in TensorFlow, TensorFlow. The important thing here is that if you use only pixels to drive your analysis by synthesis, the identity is going to be lost, which is actually inevitable. The important thing here is the analysis by synthesis method is driven by the phase recognition of the features coming from different layers of the phase recognition network that I shown be before. So, and another nice thing about that is actually you can train this method using self-supervision without having a single ground truth. So we can have an initial image and then we can train three different networks. Uh, actually, the, the, two, the important one is uh, the, 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 the regressions, the regression networks that produce the parameters of the shape, the parameters uh, shape, talking about ID and expression, parameters of the, of the gun that produce the texture. And then you can learn from a single image, you can learn these uh, regressions directly by self-supervision. So you put an image here, you create um, in the beginning, for example, random um, uh, uh, three shape and texture, then you put it on the differentiable renderer, and then it is optimized by the result, by the difference between the features of the image and the features from the differentiable renderer. So with this, you can create a 3D, full 3D reconstruction method that is actually going to be extremely efficient because this needs just three regression. Uh, they are, they, these are just networks to, uh, that do regression without uh, a single annotation. These are some uh, results of, uh, of our method. And in particular, I'm going to go on something like that. 
So this is the 3D reconstruction and the texture, importantly the texture as well, from a single image using the previous me method I have shown. Uh, the texture that you see is not the texture sample from the image, is the texture generated by our gun. So it is the, the best, let's say, reconstruction from the gun that matches the image. And you can see very diverse uh, um, uh, results here with textures. And these are some other uh, examples. Uh, because you see that the glasses have uh, been removed, because uh, the textures that have been used to train the gun um, were without all of them were without glasses. And this is actually a nice feature of our method because you can put the glass afterwards uh, with uh, synthetically. Another thing is that you can also reconstruct using, for example, the black and white, the grayscale image, because the features that we're using are coming from the face recognition network, which would not care about the color. Because we're using face recognition network and the features from the face recognition network is not directly on the color, we can do a very nice 3D reconstruction of texture and, uh, and shape from, um, from, as you see also from uh, um, um, portraits as well. And this is a comparison of the state, another further comparison of the state of, of the art. And this is a very recent work of ours submitted in, the, in CVPR. So by taking this work a step further, um, because one of the limitations of our method is that can create only the texture that is in the, within the UV map. The UV map is a near to ear texture model without hair and anything. But we can further use the style gun, a style gun, let's say, a generator, which is a generator of guns on actual images, and combine them together, the, the previous method and this method, we can do this, uh, this actually very impressive uh, results. So you can do a synthesis of, um, full synthesis of, for example, a frontal, but actually if you want other uh, uh, poses as well from a single image. So the input image is on the left, it's a profile, and the frontal image is a, a fully synthetic image of how this person is going to be looking in the profile and down is the texture UV map created uh, from, uh, from uh, the, the original image. And with that, we can generate arbitrary pose of a particular person. As you can see, the, the results are quite impressive. You can see that the, the, frontal, the frontal looks um, uh, extremely close. The identity of the frontal looks extremely close to the identity of the person. Of course, the color is going to be mismatching. It's not going to be exactly the color of the image because the, ne the network that we're using, using face recognition features, which are invariant, somewhat invariant in color. Um, of course, we can take a step further and we not only create um, a model of the face, but we can go and create a model of, of the head. I'm not going to go a lot of details of how we create it because a model of a head because we created a model of a head, a statistical model of a head from combining um, different, let's say, databases. There is a, quite a lot of statistical details there on how you create, let's say, something we call statistical kernels in Gaussian process modeling between um, uh, data that, have, that are from face, data that are from head, data that you have only in the ear, data that you have only in the eye. Uh, I'm only going to show. I'm only going to show some of the results of the statistical head model that we created, and the statistical model of the head is going to be uh, publicly available quite actually soon. Um, the statistical model of the head of the head has anthropomorphic characteristics of the head, so meaning that um, the these are all plausible uh, examples of, for of a head created. And these are some, some expression model put on top of the head that it is also statistically derived. And these are statistically derived, actually variations in many other uh, um, uh, components of the head, like the ear, like uh, the eyelids and so forth, so on. Um, of course, using the previous method and a texture completion as well, we, you can, and um, some fitting of the ears, we can do, we can use and, uh, and uh, recreate the full head anthropomorphically, the full head of the particular person, as well as trying to get 
the geometry of the ear as close as possible. And uh, by fitting also the eye, you can get also the gaze of the person. Recently, actually, we have done a work about uh, gaze, uh, gaze detection following the same path as we did for the face, dense face detection. So we do a dense localization of the eye and the coordinates of the eye. I don't go, I'm not going to go into a lot of details here. And then I'm going to, I'm using all the 3D models I've shown bef uh, before, how we can use it for generating um, uh, samples. So here is an example of what a gun is going to produce. Actually, this is the previous generation of guns, what's called Style Gun 1. As you can see, the generation of the samples from a gun, a lot of them are realistic faces. There is a realistic faces coming from the inevitable lack of 3D information uh, of a gun. A gun is a neural network, it's a regression function. It doesn't know how to, how to constrain itself using in, in the space. So that is why we believe that it is better to, uh, gen to make a gun directly on the UV space. And uh, uh, this is a gun that actually generates not only the texture, but generates together normal and shape. Uh, this is the gun we have created, and this is the gun now we're using for synthesis of humans. Of course, after you synthesize a face like that, you can project this image, as I shown before, into a style gun, and then you can get a whole uh, uh, reconstruction of an actual photorealistic uh, uh, image. So with this is the generator on a gun that produces texture, normal and shape at the same time. Of course, you can put further expressions on that, and you generate expressive images. So again, why, one of the reasons we have been doing the generation of, uh, of samples is uh, because we want to train very train um, state-of-the-art phase recognition algorithms. And from that, you can see that it's evident that in particular, in the case of, let's say, Visa, Visa and Maxot, which are uh, cases of phase recognition that are in uh, the uh, in uh, co control conditions, like the ones that you can generate with GAN. So we have created a lot of synthetic identities with uh, our GANs, actually billions of synthetic identities. And we have trained with these identities and we have shown that we using the, the data generated with the phase recognition method we've shown before, we can have the error. So as you can see, the standard act phase trained with the data that actually are publicly available, we get an error of 1.5% uh, when you allow 10 in the minus six false acceptances, one out of 1 million false acceptance. But if you use the data generated, you can do exactly half the error. So we have um, eight of 1,000. And this is a, a very um, extreme improvement. Of course, we can do the same thing. And we have done the same thing for generating uh, data for facial expression. So this is a, da a database called Fortifab that we have collected. It doesn't have a lot of people there. It has only 200 people, around 200, 250 people. And we have annotated this database with something that's called valence and arousal. So valence is how positive or negative is an expression. And arousal is how aroused you are. And then with this, you can find actually the characteristics of the shape and a subspace of the face, uh, shape from all this space, valence and arousal. And then you can use this random shape using the algorithm that I have shown before to create synthetic and synthetic example of, um, of faces with a particular balance and arousal. And with that, we have seen that actually you can improve the results a lot in many different databases by using synthetic results. So what we did <coughs> is the network of meta results shows the performance by using synthetic results, synthetic uh, images from a database and the other one network shows the CCC and the MSC, the, the correlation when using only the original images. You can see that we can improve largely the, 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 the results in many, in particular, for example, database like Recola, which is very small database by using synthetic results, synthetic examples. And actually there is a very recent work I think in this conference uh, from uh, the group of CON that's on uh, using synthetic uh, samples 
maybe actually better because you can control them better than using real samples when you train face recognition, face, facial expression recognition algorithms. Um, now, uh, I don't know how much time do I have. I didn't keep track of time, to be honest. Oh, I don't have a lot of time. I have like, let's say, another five minutes, six minutes. I've got to go a little bit fast now. I don't know, how are we regards to time? Stefano? Uh, yes, 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 you can go, I think, uh, for 10 minutes. Uh. 10 minutes, okay, perfect. So, uh, we, we wanted to take it actually a step further on that. And uh, we have something that we call a light stage in Imperial College. So in light stage, you can capture um, all the texture information of the face in various lighting conditions. And you can get also very, a lot of details on the face and particular normals. We captured a lot of um, faces in uh, using a light stage and using the patches of the face we have uh, captured we have uh, created regression networks that can take uh, the texture that we have so, uh, um, reconstructed before with our gun and create a texture that can be uh, rendered photorealistically. In particular, we can uh, uh, produce, using networks, we can produce what we call diffuse and specular albedo and diffuse and specular normals. With this, we can take, for example, the, uh, you can see here, uh, on the left hand side, you see the texture that has been generated from uh, the gun fit. And on the right, after you pass it to the networks, you can create, you can create a texture that can be rendered photorealistically under various conditions. And this is another example. So on the left hand side, you can see the texture generated by, um, by the gun fit. And uh, the shape on the right hand side, you can see a photorealistic texture that can be used and actually be rendered in various conditions. So these are other uh, examples. From a single image, we can create a texture and a full head that can be um, uh, rendered in various conditions uh, in a nice photorealistic ma manner. Um, I will tease a little bit some other works of ours since we have a lot of time. In particular, I will say a little bit about the work we did about uh, creation of uh, dense 3D flow. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of technical details here. I want to show some results and why this is important. So this is some networks that we have created. So instead of doing dense 3D phase reconstruction, what we did is we reconstruct, we reconstruct the dense flow of the phase. Um, and as you can see here, we, get, we can capture the details of um, the motion of the face. Uh, and this is very important in the synthesis of human faces. So you can see here on the left-hand side, you can see a source video of a person doing something. And on the right-hand side, you see um, uh, um, moving the motion to another person by using a standard um, uh, network for computing the flow and a network for um, dense, for predicting the dense uh, uh, human 3D flow. The dense uh, human phase 3D flow, it is also very important for what we call phase reenactment. And the, the problem of phase reenactment is you have a random, an image of a person like my face or Stefano face or another face. And then you have a video and you want to put this motion into this face this single image by, uh, uh, by, by an algorithm, in particular a gun. So um, this is some examples here. So the source is on the left, and then we want using a single image to put the motion on the right uh, hand side face. Facial motion, in particular capturing the 4D facial motion is very important. And that is why, why we did it. And this is some other examples here, using, for example, the source on the left hand side, and then using 50 frames and then 500 frames. And then uh, another 50 frames and 500 frames here. And this is a recent work of, um, of ours when we use actually uh, not only the, uh, the, the facial motion, uh, but we use also the audio information and we compare also with the state of the art. 
For example, this is a car of Italy, the recent work of Samsung uh, from uh, Moscow. Um, and the driving is on the left hand side. The reference is a single image, and the head gun you see on the right hand, hand side there is our results. Now, this, the work that you have shown right now, are not only relevant for uh, the face and the head, it's relevant because of the head, face and the head because we had very good models for 3D face and 3D head, but the work is actually very relevant for uh, other parts of the body and also hand and, uh, and, uh, and, and actually human body. So recently we have made, had a work on uh, 3D hand reconstruction networks, which was um, ranked as one of the best uh, works in the last uh, CVPR. So the work is uh, quite similar to the work I have shown for 3D phase detection. In particular, we, what we did is we created, we had a model of the 3D hand. We fitted the model of the 3D hand into a lot of in the wild images and create a lot of pseudo annotations, as well as having landmarks on the hand. And then we created the, a network that goes from the input image into the reconstruction of the hand. The hand, instead of using PCA models, as we did, as I saw you before, with a, a face and a head, um, we actually progressively now going for shape modeling into what we call um, uh, mesh convolutional networks to model shape. In particular, this is very relevant for the, the hand information of the hand because the hand is very articulated object rather than a face and a head. And it's much better to um, uh, model it with nonlinear functions, later functions. Um, and I would like to show you some videos here regarding 3D hand reconstruction. The method, is, in the method is very, very similar to the one I saw you in the beginning. That's why I didn't put a lot of technical details. It's very similar to the one I have shown you in uh, 3D, dense 3D uh, phase reconstruction. So there is a network that goes from the image to actually dense 3D information from the hand. Okay. And of course, if you want to correct a little bit, then you can take this information further and you can put another autoencoder there that projects it to, the, um, to a, a model of, of the hand that actually is going to be controlling the hand a little bit better. And of course, you can do the same thing. And I want to show you some results here. You do, can do the same thing. You can do the same thing for, uh, for the body. We created the same thing as the body and uh, the body model we have used here is a little bit more flexible um, so that you can reparametrize it and you can fit arbitrary, uh, you can put afterwards arbitrary um, parameterized um, uh, body models like these cartoons you have shown here. And I think with that, I'm going to finish. I don't think I have a lot of more time. I'm going to finish and I would be happy to uh, accept some, some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefanos, uh, for this uh, nice talk. I think, uh, uh, I hope there are many, many questions, I think. Uh, so please, now it's time for question. If you have some question, uh, I, I don't know how to process uh, Stefano about the questions. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think attendees can uh, raise the hand, yes, and uh, then they can speak, yes, of course. Please, uh, Vito, yeah, Vito. Vito, yes. Vito yes. Yeah. So, hi, Stefanos. Uh, thank hi. you very much for the very interesting talk. So, I, I would have a general question um, regarding face recognition. So, if you look at uh, what people are doing, they are often look at specific problems, either being low, res low resolution face recognition, profile face, face recognition. Um, and they're coming up with solutions that address like this specific instance of face recognition, right? So on the other hand, you have um, general models, like for example, your arc face, which improved performance on all of these tasks. So where you see um, face recognition going in the future? So, do you think it will be a general solution that would fit all different tasks or is there something that can be added by, by let's say something specific that's, that's yeah. uh, problem related? So, 
It is actually a very good question and a very relevant question, to be honest. So, uh, one of the things in the particular using these deep neural networks is you're always surprised by things that they can do and things that they cannot do. And so, the thing about uh, face, face, face recognition networks that we have trained right now, for example, at least in my experience, um, the networks are trained on uh, images that are, have been uh, collected from the web, like many celebrities, and images that they have generated, which the generation has mainly are more like the images look like images that are captured in control conditions. So there's a, 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 a mixture between images captured in control condition and images in the web, from the web. The image of the web and the ones that they created actually, have a particular distribution. So the nice thing about the, the web is one of the things that because they capture so, with so many different cameras, the network does not overfit on the camera model, which is actually very, very important. Does not overfit on the camera model, one. Second, um, it has very particular poses. Profile is not a huge problem, but for example, if you have a camera like here and capture the face, then these models will not work because you do not have that. So it is tuned to particular poses. So it is left to right, a little bit like this, but up here, it's extremely difficult. Also, if it is a lot of down there, so if it's the camera is, the camera is down there, also it's not going to work. So particular, so the statistics in particular poses and particular camera. So this camera, so if you go now to use it, for example, my, 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 my cell phone here, like, which is uh, iPhone, uses um, the infrared image to do the, 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 the recognition. Why? Because it's extremely faster. It is much faster to get with, with a single image. You can get the depth, which does the, the um, um, uh, lightness detection. But also you get the infrared, which you can do the phase recognition. But the infrared, there is a lot of information that is missing. And also it's a different kind of camera. So using, for example, the models, the generic models I have, which let's call them web models, it not, they are not optimal for this particular camera. So I see, um, um, I see different poses. For example, the poses is the most important, let's say, for me. A challenge, in particular the pose on the app, but it's mainly because there are, we're missing this pose as data. If somehow we can get these poses and put it in an arc phase, they will, it, it would be fine. But the other one, which I think it's more, more difficult, and I do not know if you're going to have a generic model, is different camera variations. In particular, the infrared camera, I think you have to have a different model, for example, for that. And it's, it's, and the most actually expensive part of when Apple made the, the new cell phone and had the face ID is how to capture a huge amount of data for infrared cameras. So there are some, some challenges, but mainly coming for pose, as I said, and camera. Okay, thank you. So the, the answer is you have not solved it all, so there's still room for No, no, there's no, 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 no. But I mean, yeah, so no, no. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any other question? Uh, I have uh, I have one, uh, Stefano. Yeah. Uh, no, one, um, the results that you presented are very very impressive, especially for for face recognition. And I have a question about uh, the, the 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 generation of synthetic images, in particular. Uh, the question is if there is some way to understand, uh, uh, let me say, how many images we, we should or we can generate in order to uh, improve the result. Uh, I mean, how many um, new uh, variants in the data it is necessary to uh, bring, to put in the data in order to have an improvement. If, if it is possible to evaluate some, uh, let me say, threshold, some uh, um, some yeah. percentage of images that we have to add in order to have an improvement. 
and uh, uh, also which is the, the statistics of the data that we should inject in the in, in the training data in order to improve the, the, the performance. Actually, there's a very good question. So let me actually show you a little bit the kind of data I have been generating. The generation, the generated look look like that, but without the normals. A texture, but then cut around the face, something like that. And I did it mainly. I did the mainly with this generation because I was lacking images that are captured in control condition. I did not have visa, for example, visa uh, images. I did not have. I, I do not have access to any visa images, as like like uh, ever AI and Deep Zilind and Vision Labs that have access to huge database on Visa. I don't know how, but they have. Uh, I don't have this kind of images. So I have somehow to generate these images because our control conditions there and the variability within this control condition is much different than the variability you're going to be seeing in the wild condition. So let me tell you two, three things I, from my experience in training. Uh, there is a limitation on how many some uh, date let's say classes your network can digest so i have not seen any improvement after let's go going beyond a million or two million classes classes talking about ids so there is there is a a, a capacity let's say of classes you may have Especially for face, I don't know if, if it is for all objects, but for faces it is. Because after that, faces are going to be looking extremely similar to each other. Uh, the second thing is about the variability you're going to be having within your class. If, for example, you take my, my, my face and you put in my class, the image I had for when I was born, and let's say how I would be, or let's, let's say Woody Allen, that we have images from when he was born until now he's in his 80s. And you put all of these and various poses, illuminations, and you put it inside the class, the network is not going to learn anything because you have put so much variability, which says, you said, what is your network learning? Some kind of invariances. Tell your network, tell me, find me from these images, a kind of invariances that are going to be within the face. So it's going to be invariant to pose, invariant on this, invariant on what kind of patterns I should keep in order to match a face, whatever kind of aging is going to happen, whatever kind of pose is going to have, whatever occlusion is going to have, and whatever kind of, let's say, I don't know, makeup is going to have. In the end, the network is not going to learn anything. So you have to, because it's going to learn everything. When you tell the network, learn everything, it's going to learn nothing. So you have to be careful also the variability you're going to be keeping there. You want some variability, but you don't want a lot of variability as well. Uh, this is actually something we're currently working on to see how much variability you should have in your class. So you have to think how many classes you're going to have, especially for faces, uh, because faces, as I said, is an extreme result, extreme problem of fine-grained fine -grained object recognition. Classes are looking the same, nevertheless, they can be very similar. So there, there is, there is a trade-off there. My face and your face are going to be different, but, but there are a lot of it's much similar my face and your face than my face and the door, for example. So there are, they, you have to be careful on how much variability you're going to introduce with regard to the classes and with regard to within the same class because. My face, your face is going to be similar, much more similar than my face when I was five and my face now. So you have to be keep, you have, you have to have a trade-off. Right now we're just doing it empirical, empirically. Nevertheless, in order to do it properly, the theoretical, the theoretical analysis we have right now for actually doing any theoretical analysis of neural networks is actually zero. All the theory that exists right now, even if you see NIPS is irrelevant. Actually, it's better not to read any papers on there. That it's, the life is too short to read, uh, to read these papers. His life is too short. Don't read this. The, the, the theory is irrelevant. If the theory was relevant, like before it was kernel method and SVM, the theory was relevant, it's nice. Now the theory is totally irrelevant, totally irrelevant. They are talking about in another problem and they're saying they have a theory for another problem, for another problem, it's totally, so, the only thing I see right now is just doing a empirical analysis on the networks, 
Are theoretical, theoretical mm -hmm. tools that we have are, yeah, are actually non-existent right now, which is a pity, but... No. No, thank you very much. Uh, no, I don't know if there are uh, other questions. Otherwise, I have another quick, uh, <laughs> quick one. Um, now, the other question is about the, the, the 3D reconstruction and, uh, uh, and the generation. And I would like to know uh, how much the problem of expressions is, uh, is solved. Is, uh, it is uh, still a problem to generate a strong or um, strong expression and with the topological variation or if it is uh, solved? No, uh, what is actually missing right now in particular because we're missing <clears throat> of this data uh, 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 in, uh, in uh, a large scale is um, uh, the texture in different expressions. The same models we have are okay, but the same models only model, let's say, the, the low frequency of uh, like this here. Yeah. This thing, it's difficult now to generate. We don't have the data to do that. No. Right now, I don't have the data to do that. Um, another, for example, wrinkles, wherever you're going to be having wrinkles. So this is something we're missing. And the data I have, for example, for that is very few people. I have data with many different expressions for let's say around 200 people, but it's very difficult to use this to, uh, to go. So a, a, a large scale capturing of people in 4D is something welcome if someone wants to do that. Um, this is actually what is missing right now, a large scale uh, 4D. And then you're going to have very strong, very, you can make very strong pri priors for the texture as well as the shape. Okay. Thank you very much. I think, uh, Mohamed, we are running out of the, the time. So uh, uh, yes, but maybe the last question. Ah, yes, sure. <laughs> there is some last question. It's okay. So if uh, there is no question, uh, thank you again, uh, Stefanos, uh, for very, uh, very nice, nice no story. Worries. Thanks a lot and, as well. Uh, uh, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you again. And now we are going to start uh, our um, first talk, but maybe you have a break now, Stefano? 10 minutes yes. of break? Yes, in the, in the program, there was a break of five minutes, yes. Yes, five minutes, so we yes. can, we can, uh, who is the next? Uh, uh, the, uh, the next talk, the next speaker is Mundi. Okay, you are here. Okay, oh. perfect. So in in five minutes we start uh, the next uh, the next talk, and um, okay, are you ready? Yes, of course. Okay, okay. so in five minutes. Sure. How are you, Vito? Hi, what about you? <laughs> that, it was really an interesting talk. I hope you yeah, 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 it didn't have any technical issues with, with logging in and so on. Uh, yeah. But looking forward to a great workshop. So the start yeah. was uh, very promising. Yeah. I see also your workshop, very interesting as speakers, but I didn't uh, attend this, this very nice workshop. Yeah, so nice with, uh, with Ali, yeah. We, we will post the videos also um, on Are underline. Oh, okay. um, we, we will post them. So I just sent the, the link to, to the okay. coordinator. This and then you can always have a look if there's something okay, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I will look at this. It's a very nice workshop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. So how is Lila? Uh, Lila, it's, it's fine. It's very cold now. Very cold. Yeah. <laughs> and you? What is Yubana? What are you exactly now? I, I'm in Ljubljana, so uh, yeah, I, I just went uh, on, on the snow with my kids earlier today, so uh, just came oh. back to watch the keynote, and, yeah, so you can hear them probably in the back, <laughs> the kids screaming, yeah, great. Okay, give me one minute, please, I'm coming, one minute, I'm coming. Okay, and I, I'll say goodbye also to everyone, so. Uh, have a nice workshop. Uh, okay. Nice thank rest you, of the workshop. Thank yeah. you. Thank Bye. you very much, uh, Vito. Bye, Mohamed. Yeah. Keep, uh, keep in touch. Huh? Yeah, sure. Of course. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.
So maybe we can start now if you. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sure. Uh, so so the next, uh, Stefano, please, you can maybe introduce the next talk. Okay, so the, the next uh, paper is uh, Shine On Illuminating Design Choices for Practical Video Based Virtual Clothing Try On. And the work is presented by Gaurav Kupa. So Great. please, Thank Gaurav, you, you can. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you for organizing the great workshop. I've enjoyed it thus far. Um, so yeah, uh, the uh, my talk will cover uh, five uh, uh, sections. Uh, first, I'll talk about the motivations and contributions, a short literature review, talk about our approach, uh, showcase our results, and then finally end up with a conclusion. So first, uh, the motivation for virtual try-on and our contributions. So the problem of virtual try-on broadly is when you take an input as a person image and a clothing image, and you want to uh, have a uh, output generated image of the end person trying on the set clothing. Generally, this problem can be approached from several domains, one being an image-based domain. Um, uh, we, in our work, we propose a virtual, uh, we propose a video-based domain. Uh, so first, I would also say that uh, there's great reason to pursue this problem. Virtual try-on has a large market space. Uh, so with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, e-commerce has become a larger part of our fabric in society than ever before. Um, more and more people are depending on online shopping and delivery services to get essential and non-essential goods. Even before the pandemic, online shopping had uh, substantially increased every single year, as we can see in this, in this chart. There's a clear trend that online sales are progressively taking up a larger share of the commerce market, as they're increasing about 1% to 1.2% each year. In 2020, the pandemic led to a large markup of almost 4%. We can see the huge market opportunity that e-commerce presents. When we look at the fashion apparel marketplaces, we see large issues of returns in online shopping. A customer who is shopping online is three times as likely to return their item than a customer who buys the item in store. This problem is further compounded by the issue that customers don't know if an apparel item will fit them, look good on them, or feel good. This uncertainty leads to customer dissatisfaction, wasted package, and transportation costs, um, not to mention the environmental impact. Employing an effective virtual try-on system would help circumvent these, system, uh, these problems by providing a better shopping experience for the customer. Furthermore, um, there's a large interest in virtual try-on from an academic perspective. The new field of neural rendering organizes deep, in, deep image and video generation approaches that enable explicit control or implicit control of scene properties, such as geometry, appearance, semantic structure, et cetera. So some examples of this are novel view synthesis, relighting, face and body reenactment, and more. Uh, so virtual try-on is one of these tasks that's encapsulated in the neural rendering field, warping and controlling the appearance of a clothing item in any specific post deformation, and generating high quality cot synthesis with virtual try-on garnishes great academic interest and serves as a valuable part, valuable literature of uh, the neural rendering field. Virtual try-on is a meaningful problem to tackle due to its practical application as well as uh, academic interest. So the main contributions of our paper are that we provide uh, rigorous uh, scientific experiments testing the effectiveness of recent deep learning breakthroughs uh, so it's very clear as to why uh, we chose the design that we did, uh, because uh, there's quantitative and qualitative backing. Uh, we also released the first open source extensible video based virtual try on code base. So this is great for scientific reproducibility and uh, future work to build on top of our code base. And lastly, we pre present clear design choices for video based virtual try. So uh, now I'll go into a brief literature review. <clears throat> so in conducting virtual try-on, fashion data sets and human parsing annotations are critical to our work. Zue Lu et al. Uh, created the Deep Fashion data set in 2016, and Yu Ying Yi et al. created the Deep Fashion 2 data set in 2019. 
as shown in the slide here, Kay Kong et al. introduced the LIP dataset, a group of, 50, of over 50,000 images, uh, which are annotated uh, with 20 categories of human body parts and 16 different body joints. In addition, the LIP dataset contains images of humans from different complex human poses, including occlusions, back view, et cetera. Several works have built on top of the LIP dataset to include a combination of human parsing and pose annotations. These annotations led to more robust parsing models, such as SSL, JPPNet, SCHP, and more. In our work, we investigated the effect in effectiveness of different pose annotations and utilized human parsing annotations to improve the quality of virtual trial. So uh, the two seminal works of image-based virtual trial are Viton and CPVTON. So both works include a two-staged approach. The first stage consists of uh, using a person representation and a clothing item to generate a warp cloth. This warp cloth is a, a clothing item warped into a specific pose deformation. So Viton uses a static shape context matching algorithm to warp this cloth. Uh, on the other hand, CPVTON improves on this method to use a geometric matching module to warp the cloth. Our work takes from CPVTON and uses the geometric matching module as a pre-trained model for our warping module. The second stage of Viton and CPVTON synthesizes the cloth onto the end person to generate the try-on person. So this uh, uses a UNet model. Uh, we build on top of this existing uh, model to investigate design architectures uh, to improve the performance of clot synthesis and try and person generation. Dong et al. was the first to achieve video clothing try on in 2019, including the entire try on processing, uh, warp, and texturing stages. The network is named Flow Warping GAN, or FWGAN for short, for its incorporation of optical flow to address temporal consistency issues and the warping of desired clothes and user to the video pose. The problem that is formulated here differs from the problem formulation of our work. So here, the uh, clothing image is warped onto the person image, and then that person, that try-on person is then reposed into a sequence of video poses. Our problem formulation is to synthesize the cloth of the image directly onto a video, uh, a set of video uh, frames of a fashion model walking. Similar to FWGAN, we, our work also uses optical flow. <clears throat> Lastly, the uh, rise of attention has taken over the image domain. Recently, there have been works to incorporate transformers into object detection uh, and achieve state-of-the-art performance. Additionally, self-attention has been used to achieve state-of-the-art performance in conditional image generation. In our work, we show that using self-attention improves the quality of clock texture in video-based virtual trial. Great. So now I'll talk about our approach. So some of the existing problems that exist with virtual trial are that there are, there's a large memory and time requirement for training. Uh, these models generally have to train for between 40 to 60 hours. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that's a problem that we address. Uh, furthermore, there's a lack of high quality clot synthesis. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, artifacts that exist. Um, and also the, tem there's a, the generated videos are still temporally inconsistent. So, our, uh, so the improvements that we make uh, rain, uh, are categorized into three, um, three categories. Uh, first, is we investigate the value of pose representations. So previous methods use COCO pose pose representations, which are a uh, sparse tensor of uh, 18 depth tensor. Uh, this, uh, we find that this uh, pose representation uh, is not an accurate uh, representation of human body in space, uh, also takes up a large amount of uh, memory um, with leading to uh, subpar results. We opt to use Facebook's dense pose annotations uh, as it's able to um, model more accurately the human body uh, shape and facial structure. 
Additionally, we are inspired by the onset of attention and utilize attention in our virtual try-on models. This uh, improves face and neck quality synthesis. And lastly, uh, we investigate the value of high frequency robustness. So uh, there has been literature that states that uh, RELU networks are biased to low frequency uh, information and uh, in the virtual try-on domain, low frequency information uh, corresponds to geometry and shape, uh, whereas high frequency information, which is the goal, corresponds to cloth texture and synthesis. So we want to uh, see if using different activation functions leads to higher quality cloth synthesis. So without further ado, our, our model is, uh, so our model uses a, a general unit architecture, which is your standard encoder decoder architecture uh, with skip connections. Uh, we interlace this encoder decoder architecture with attention models uh, as shown before. And then here we can uh, add the try on inputs. So the current frame uh, cloth image, this cloth image is, uh, entered into the TPS warping pre-model, uh, pre-trained model. Uh, so then you uh, get the cloth, uh, warp cloth. Um, and the outputs are a raw rendered uh, uh, person image, which we do a mask computation, composition, so you get a person try. <clears throat> On top of this, we add a dense pose pose representation. So we find uh, that this dense pose pose representation improves face and neck quality. And so we enter this uh, and do a concatenation into our uh, person inputs. And lastly, we incorporate uh, optical flow. So we use previous frame, calculate the flow, optical flow between current and previous frame, <clears throat> as you can see here. Um, and then we use this uh, flow or previous frame and uh, concatenate it with the generated, uh, per, uh, the generated raw uh, composed warp cloth uh, to enable Temporal consistency in our outputs. Great. So now I'll go into our results. <clears throat> so first we uh, look at uh, the effectiveness of using cocoa pose pose annotations versus dense pose pose annotations. So I should mention here, what you're going to see here on the left hand side is going to be a video of uh, three columns, the left being uh, ground truth uh, video, the second column being the uh, cocoa pose annotation, uh, the network that uses cocoa pose annotations, and the third column being the network that uses dense pose annotations. On the right hand side, the x axis is the number of frames, and on the y axis, it's going to be the SSIM metric value and the PSNR metric value on the bottom. Um, the blue corresponds to the first column and the green corresponds to the second column. Similarly, red to first, yellow to the second. The, all of our results follow a similar, uh, similar format. So if you, if we to, uh, oh, another thing that I should mention here is uh, SSIM and PSNR uh, metrics are not a great um, representation of virtual try on output. So uh, due to the lack of great metrics, the visual inspection is absolutely necessary here. So here, uh, you can see uh, in this video that uh, the Cocoa Pose Pose Annotation Network has poor uh, facial uh, quality, uh, whereas the Dense Pose Pose uh, Representation Network um, has stronger facial free features. So another example here, using Cocoa Pose Pose annotations has quite poor uh, face quality, but when we use Dense Pose, our facial quality uh, is, uh, we improve facial quality. Uh, and this, uh, <clears throat> this result is actually backed up by the uh, qualitative uh, outputs. So we can see that the SSIM and PSNR for both examples are much higher than for uh, using Cocoa Pose. So as a result, we, uh, we find that the testing difference, uh, that dense pose is the better uh, pose representation to use. Next, we look at the effect of efficacy of adding attention to our model. So here, uh, 
here, uh, first column is ground truth, no attention, and then attention. So um, if you can see here, the quality of the face uh, is uh, similar. The quality of the cloth is quite similar. Uh, there are slight improvements in terms of the neck quality, neck quality and synthesis. And there's no measurable improvement from a qualitative metric standpoint. Furthermore, we see a similar thing where there's uh, improvement in terms of neck, uh, neck synthesis, um, but no measurable improvement in terms of uh, quality of cloth synthesis. For this reason, we say that attention slightly improves face and neck quality. Um, yeah. Now we'll look at uh, the effectiveness of using RailU activation functions versus DLU activation functions uh, to improve cloth synthesis. So here is a RailU activation function. Here is a GALU activation function. Again, uh, the slight improvement here. There's a there's no measurable difference here. Um, the uh, slight improvement comes with. Uh, let me play the video again. Uh, the slight improvement comes when you have some uh, better quality of neck and actually zoomed out facial view is actually higher quality when you're using the GALU activation function. And I can showcase this in a few more videos. So in the zoomed out videos, uh, the GALU activation function improves as well. There are still several flickering artifacts and discoloration that exist within our method uh, that would be great for future work. Um, again, another result, um, RailU and then GALU. So no, uh, there's no uh, uh, qualitative uh, improvement between ReLU and GALU, but there is a uh, slight edge that we give to GALU due to its uh, improvement in zoomed out face, face speed. Then we test the effectiveness of ReLU versus SWISH activation function. And here uh, it's quite obvious from a qualitative and quantitative perspective that ReLU performs better. Uh, less discoloration on the arms, cloth quality, and uh, in terms of the qualitative metrics, uh, ReLU outperforms switch. And this story is told again in this example. Poor, poor cloth quality, poor uh, pant synthesis as well. So we say that the ReLU activation function is better than the switch. And lastly, we evaluate the differences between GALU and SWISH. So this is the GALU activation function. This is the SWISH activation function. Um, similar story, uh, GALU does a better job of synthesizing clothes as well as, uh, as well as general body features. This story is supported uh, by the qualitative, uh, qualitative metrics. In the in sense of the GALU activation function, um, there are stronger features in terms of bo uh, body synthesis, cloth quality, neck, face, uh, than the switch activation function. So for this reason, we say that uh, our design choice for shine on is to use the GALU activation function. So as a recap, um, uh, so these uh, charts, uh, the x-axis is all the frame numbers. Uh, and so we do a standard uh, deviation and mean uh, uh, PSNR SSIM value over all the videos in our data set uh, and uh, do a standard deviation uh, per frame. And so you can see uh, on the left-hand side, the effect of dense pose uh, improves the quality of um, uh, the output over cocoa pose. Using uh, attention in the middle, using attention has no meaningful impact from a qualitative perspective, but using visual inspection, we see that it slightly improves neck and face quality. <clears throat> the effect of activation functions, although from a um, quantitative, uh, qualitative perspective, uh, sorry, a quantitative perspective, 
um, the uh, uh, Swift GLU and uh, RailU are all generally similar, but a qualitative inspection uh, states otherwise. So uh, I'll end off with a brief conclusion. Um, so our main contributions for our paper is to use uh, dense post-pose annotations for a smaller memory footprint and better face synthesis. The GALU activation function leads to stronger, um, stronger uh, cloth and body synthesis and using self-attention improves the quality of cloth texture. Improvement. Um, a uh, future work here uh, is to improve uh, neck quality. Uh, throughout our methods, there's poor neck synthesis. Uh, so investigating this would be a future work. Uh, improving temporal consistency and uh, flickering artifacts between frames, um, as well as uh, using better cloth warping methods to model deformations between uh, back view, as well as uh, and uh, being able to uh, model clots in, in terms of the 3D space uh, would be also future work. Thank you for listening to my talk. You can contact me at uh, this email or connect with me at LinkedIn. Uh, you can scan on the left-hand side for the archive paper or on the right-hand side for the code. Thank you. I can, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? I, I, I have one question, Stefano. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I have one question. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much for this uh, nice talk. Uh, there are many things. Uh, so I have uh, one question about the criteria. You now, because in your talk you talk about two criteria: pace and air for no noise, and um, and the other last one, it's uh, second one, it's it's some uh, structure similarity index. Mm -hmm. But why you don't use, for example, inception score, you know, uh, or some other, you know, score or some criteria? Um, so uh, generally, generally we uh, we looked through uh, a few different metrics, and uh, we found that there was no general difference. We also looked at the FID uh, score. We looked at the inception score. There's no general difference between, um, like, uh, th there's no. Um, silver bullet metric that would judge the quality of virtual trying effectively. Uh, and so we opted to use SSIM and PSNR uh, because uh, our pre uh, previous existing methods also used those scores. Uh, and so it'd be easier to compare. Okay. Good question, thank you. Um, I have also uh, a question. Uh, sure. No, my question is if the dense pose, does it provide you some 3D information or it is just 2D information? Uh, so the, the dense pose uh, annotation that we use is just going to be like a general, uh, 2D picture. Uh, so, uh, but there is uh, some literature that states that uh, the UV map uh, does give you some 3D information. Uh, and so uh, in our method, we don't uh, extrapolate any 3D information from the dense pose annotations, but uh, the dense pose uh, has much more uh, quality in terms of determining uh, smoother parts of the face. So uh, the, the part, the, it, there's, it, it models more 3D information in 2D space than kind of other pose annotations that we see. Okay. And what's another quick one is, um, no, from, from from the results that uh, you have uh, uh, shown, uh, it is evident that uh, there are some problems in the neck uh, region. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would like to to know if you have some explanation for for this uh, behavior in that region. I mean, uh, which is the, the, the which is, that causes this uh, this this behavior? I mean, sure. Yeah. So uh, uh, generally, what happens is that. Um, uh, pre so, so previous methods, what they do is that they use um, a, a face refinement network after they do the virtual uh, per person try on. Um, so we don't use such a face refinement network. And so with that, uh, some of the quality of the neck is not there. Uh, so we are still able to generate strong uh, face quality because of the dense pose, but uh, 
the uh, net quality is not there. So uh, a simple fix to that uh, would be if you were to um, use a, a class segment, uh, sorry, a body segmentation of the input. Uh, if, oh, how about I go back here? So if you were to uh, use a, a body segmentation of our current fa frame and you can pass in as input um, and at the end, when you get your output, you can warp the uh, neck information. So you, you can extrapolate the neck information from there and warp it at the end. It's a very qu a quick fix, uh, but uh, the network would not be learning that information. So uh, we, uh, we, didn't, we didn't incorporate that into our network. So the long story is that there's a fix to the uh, poor neck quality, but to get a um, more general solution to that uh, uh, would be the future. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Any other questions? I have only one question it's about uh, the, the size of training you know, data. What is exactly the size of your training data? Because I think you need a uh, uh, lot of data you know, for training. Yes. So and how, do you, and how do you collect your data? What is ground truth exactly? Because uh, I, I agree that it's uh, uh, it's not, I think it's not easy, you know, to, to annotate this ground. Yes, yes. So um, the data that we use was proposed, was uh, given by FW GAN. Uh, so they released the data set of 661 videos of fashion models walking. Uh, and uh, so, and each frame, each video has about 250 to 300 frames. So uh, a lot of training data for us to use. Uh, and to answer your second question, how are these, uh, how is this data annotated? Um, so each data has, um, so what we do is that, um, okay, wait, wait, sorry. Your question about how it's annotated is that uh, there is a, uh, um, a fashion model walking with a source cloth image and then the target cloth image. And that's uh, how we train the model. So these were specifically collected for the FWGAN and we use their data. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there any question or maybe we can So if there is, if there are no question, maybe now we can ask the next speaker to, I will introduce the next speaker. So the next talk is about um, facial expression neutralization with the stock net. Uh, and uh, the talk will be given by, I don't know, where is he or her? So who is uh, the speaker? Ah. Hmm. Stefano, I, I don't remember, we don't have a... Uh... No, they, they didn't send us any video, backup video. So uh, it is... Yeah. Uh, is a big problem. So what we can do, maybe we can uh, start with the next, the following one. And uh, maybe we can... Yes, start. maybe they can have some uh, connection problem. They maybe join us later, yeah, maybe, right? Yeah. So if the following one, I think he's here. Hazi Karazali is here. Yes. I think Hello. We can... Hello, Azik. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can start with this one and wait. Uh, make maybe some information from. Uh, okay, from sure. The others of the paper. Do I do I agree with this, uh, Azik? It's okay for you. you yeah, are, it's okay you for me. It's okay. 
Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, I, I will switch now to, to uh, talk of uh, log likely, likelihood uh, regularization, uh, no regularization, um, kind of divergence for video prediction with the 3D uh, convolutional variational recurrent network and given by Hazi Karazali. Thank you. Uh, so, hi everyone. My name is Hazik, and today I'm going to be presenting my work titled Log Likelihood Regularized KL Divergence for Future Frame Prediction uh, with a 3D Convolutional Variational Recurrent Network done together with Basura Fernando at the Agency for Science, Technology and Research, Singapore. Uh, this is the overview for today. I will start off with the problem statement and the motivation behind it. I will then be sharing some related works for the sake of context before stating the aim of, of our study. Uh, thereafter, I will present our method and our results before concluding. So our task is, given a sequence of images from X0 to XW as context, we want to predict several frames from XW plus 1 to XW plus 1 plus T into the future. And that could be useful for several reasons with the most relevant being for action anticipation, where the goal is to predict what the person might do before observing that action. For example, it would be useful for a system uh, on board a self-driving car to generate the future frames of the person and the environment to foresee if the pedestrians will cross the road. There is a number of related work that can be used for future frame prediction, and you can break them up into two main groups deterministic models and stochastic models. So a majority of the deterministic models, including the state of the art, are often built on top of recurrent networks that are represented here by the block F theta. They are then trained to minimize the reconstruction loss between the predicted output and the ground truth, with the reconstruction loss being either the L1 or L2 or even the adversarial loss. The disadvantage of these methods, however, is that because they are deterministic, they can only do a one-to-one -one or a many-to-one -one mapping. Uh, but the future is uncertain because for any given input, there can be a number of highly possible outputs based on the data set. And so for a robot to operate or plan in an unknown environment, it must learn how to forecast multiple futures and not only one. And so that is where the stochastic or generative models come in. They model the probability distribution of the data during training and during testing, condition the forward pass on this distribution to produce an output. Uh, because this sampling is random, there is some level of noise during the forward pass that results in the output being unique at every run. So as previously mentioned, the deterministic models are often built using recurrent networks that can be represented by the figure on the left and the equations on the right. So if we represent the hidden states of a recurrent network using the node H, we can then illustrate the forward pass of a deterministic model as follows, where at every time step, you have the input image X that is fed into the recurrent model to produce the hidden states H. Uh, this hidden state is then sent through some function to predict the next frame X hat. Uh, this can then be extended into a sequence to predict as far into the future as desired. In a stochastic recurrent network, you now have this additional node Z that is produced in two steps. You first send the hidden states through the neural network to produce the parameters of a Gaussian distribution, mu and sigma. You then sample from this to obtain Z. Uh, this Z is then conditioned, this Z is then used to condition the generation X as well as the hidden states H, uh, introducing some form of stochasticity to the entire network. So you can see in the equations that the predicted image x hat as well as the hidden states h both now have z in their functions. So there are two things that uh, we now need to optimize for, the predictions x as well as the distribution z. The standard way to optimize for z is to compute the KL divergence between the prior, which is a unit Gaussian, and the posterior, which is the output of a neural network as shown in the red boxes and red arrows. The second, which is done by Castrejon et al, and is also what we use in our work, is to let both the prior and posterior be the output of neural networks, where the posterior is some function over the present and the future, 
indicated by the, the arrows and equations highlighted in red and the prior sum function of the present indicated by the arrows and the equations in blue. So there are several other ways to, to compute this KL divergence, but in summation, stochastic models are trained to minimize a sum of the reconstruction and latent loss. In our work, we wanted to see if there are ways to further improve on or even customize this latent loss, as well as further improve on the architecture itself uh, in terms of reducing the total number of parameters. So in the following slides, we will present to you our contributions for the set items followed by our findings thus far. So as previously mentioned, we followed the method of Castrejon et al. that minimizes the divergence between the prior and posterior Gaussians denoted by P and Q respectively, where the parameters are of both of these Gaussians are the output of neural networks. In our work, we appended this negative, the negative log likelihood colored in red to the KL divergence, where this time around we assume that the prior, posterior, and the conditional prior mean all follow a Gaussian distribution. So interestingly, uh, these terms can be merged to result in a final expression that looks similar to the KL divergence, but with some of its components reweighted. Specifically, the log posterior variance has now been scaled by a factor of two and the difference of mean by a factor of three. So we can interpret this as follows. One is that there is now less emphasis on the prior variance compared to the posterior variance, uh, which could intuitively mean a more diverse output when sampling through the prior Gaussian. And two, that the scaled difference of mean serves to balance out the additional weight assigned to the variance term so that the model continues generating samples that are representative of the ground truth. So again, this addition of the log likelihood to the KL divergence results in an expression similar to itself, but with some of its components weighted differently. And we can think of this as some sort of regularizer to the original term. Uh, so this actually does best some conceptual similarity to the L1 plus L2 uh, reconstruction loss used by the following works. Uh, they were able to show that the summation of these two terms together are better than their standalone counterparts. And finally, we point out that these components can be manually tuned, although the experimentation of different values is not the purpose of this study. So moving on to our architecture, uh, our architecture is an incremental upgrade of the 2D variational convolutional STM, LSTMs used in past work. Here we have replaced all 2D convolutions with 3D from the image encoder to the LSTM to the networks that generate the uh, parameters of the Gaussian distribution as well as the image decoder. So at any given time step, the network takes as input a clip of frames to forecast the clip one time step into the future. There are several advantages of using 3D convolutions as opposed to 2D in the context of 2D, uh, in the context of frame prediction. Uh, these are not novel, of course, but they are still interesting to think of nonetheless. So the first is that we can vary the window size M or the number of input and output frames at each time step based on the amount of motion we wish to capture. So for example, we can set a large M if it is important for the model to observe a long, longer sequence at every time step without being forced to heavily sample the data set. Uh, second is that we can set H or how far into the future should the model predict at each time step, uh, which similarly can be useful if the model needs to be able to observe far into the future uh, given the input clip at each time step. Uh, the third is that we can take advantage of 3D convolution model, convolutional models that have been pre-trained for action recognition which is useful in helping accelerate or stabilize learning, especially on video sequences that contain a human performing some action. Uh, lastly is that recurrent models fitted with 2D convolutions only allow motion information to be stored in the hidden states. With 3D convolutions, however, there is now an additional source of information coming from the output of the image encoders, or X. So going back to the architecture, there are many choices for both the image encoder and decoder. Uh, in our work, we use a truncated 3D ResNet 18 that has been pre-trained on the kinetics data set. 
So this task differs from the existing work of Castre John et al. that made use of the entire 2D ResNet for encoding and decoding. The main advantage in doing this is the savings in the large number of parameters. For example, a full 3D ResNet 18 with four blocks would contain uh, 33 million parameters, whereas another with only two blocks would contain only 2 million parameters. So although there is a reduction in the model's complexity, this cut allows us to reallocate some of the parameters to the LSTM, which serves as extensions of the uh, 3D convolutions. So uh, ultimately, our hypothesis is that there is no need for a very large image encoder and decoder, since the 3D LSTMs themselves serve ex as extensions of the encoders for learning spatial, spatial temporal information. Uh, there is also the option of not having an image encoder and decoder, which we wanted to avoid as we feel that it would put too much strain on the LSTMs to learn from a raw set of images. So here are just some results on frame forecasting on the MNIST data set uh, using metrics like the Structural Similarity Index, SSIM, and the Mean Squared Error, MSC. So the notation at the top of the third column uh, from the left means that the model takes as input a sequence of five frames to predict the next 10 frames, whereas in the second column, a sequence of five frames to pre predict the next 15 frames and so on. So you can see that the numbers between the competitive methods are all pretty close. Uh, but what's important is the fact that on the rightmost column is that our method requires only 12.9 million parameters compared to the state-of-the-art deterministic model at 38 million parameters and the state-of-the-art stochastic model at 62 million parameters. So we believe this is due to our design choice, making use of a smaller 3D image encoder for feature extraction which allows us to increase the size of the LSTM. And then here are some other results on the KTH data set. Again, we are able to achieve numbers that are competitive while having fewer parameters. So in this case, the advantages of using a variational inference can also be observed here, namely that both our method and our Chang et al. are able to recover the person after it, he exits the frame. So uh, next, we studied the effect of each component. We studied the effect each component has on the performance of our model. So the first row represents the results of the 2D convolutional LSTM model. The second, using variational inference. The third, using 3D convolutions. And the fourth, with our proposed log likelihood loss. So it can be seen from the table that there is a slight improvement of the metrics for the model that has been trained with the additional log likelihood criter criterion. So initially, we thought that this was due to uh, lucky, better uh, local minima, but we've retrained the model several times and the model uh, that incorporates the log like criter criterion consistently came out slightly better. Uh, but what's more important here is the fact that minimizing the sum of these two losses is not detrimental to the performance of the model, since it is ultimately still the KL divergence, but with some of its components weighted differently. So as of now, we are studying the effects different weights have on the performance of the model on various data sets because the results here and the formulation here is uh, purely empirical. So lastly, we studied the effects different window sizes and output horizons have on our model. In the figures, the y-axis represents the reconstruction metric, whereas the x-axis, the time step that value was recorded at, so as expected, the models perform worse the further they forecast into the future. Uh, unfortunately, with the current setup and data set, we could not find a correlation between the configuration and the performance of the model. Uh, however, we still believe that the window size will have a part to play when it becomes necessary to capture longer durations without being forced to sample the input clip. And so in conclusion, uh, we have presented a 3D convolutional variational recurrent network with an extra log likelihood criterion introduced during training that acts as tunable weights to the TL divergence. So we also propose the benefits of using a smaller convolutional network for encoding and decoding, namely that it lets us cut down on the total number of parameters without hampering too much on the performance of the model, especially since these models themselves have been initialized on the kinetics data set 
and can extract features that are sufficiently general for the LSTMs to further learn on. So thank you. Hey, thank you very thank much for- Thank you very much. Um, please, if you have uh, questions, you have questions? Um, I have a question, uh, Azik, about um, what you, I would like to understand, uh, uh, because uh, I think the main idea of your work is uh, the prediction of video. And, um, but I would like that you give me, or to give us uh, uh, some definition about what we would like to predict. Is it um, a short frame or long frame? I, I don't know exactly. I, I would like to understand. Uh, we're trying to predict the basically we're just trying to predict the frames uh, that's all over uh, uh, as long for as long as possible yes uh, mm -hmm. i understood that but uh, in your work mm -hmm. because uh, what i mean i mean it seems that uh, the stm or um you know because uh, is working frame by frame yeah it seems that the lstm cannot you know predict for long term is it correct yeah, uh, that's quite correct. Uh, but uh, currently, if uh, variational methods tend to be able to predict longer into the future, uh, but the problem that they have is that um, the, the they they are not the frames generated by these variational methods are not as uh, sharp, are not as uh, they they are blurrier than deterministic met uh, methods. So in our work, we saw we found that using three D convolutions. With, by using 3D convolutions throughout the entire model, we were able to predict for a longer duration. Uh, we believe it's because if you use 3D convolutions, you're able to predict several frames at every time step. And so um, this act as some form of regularization because there's, there needs to be some form of consistency between the frames. Uh, how many frames in general you would like to, to predict um... Um, so in our experiment, we, sorry. So in our experiments on the KTH data set, uh, our input was only ten frames, and we predicted the next sixty frames. But at every time step, uh, we took in as input a clip of four to eight frames. Uh huh. Yep. Okay. And do you have some video about the quality of uh, visual quality of the prediction or some something like that? Uh, we I have a know. video, but it's not in the slides. Uh, okay, it's okay. okay. Uh, yes, I have a question also. Um, mm, looking to, to these videos, uh, it seems, I don't know if uh, this is a representative of all the, of all the data, but it seems that uh, the, 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 the motion of the people is uh, uh, at least the people is given by a green uh, dressing with the white uh, background. So uh, I would like to know if uh, uh, in this approach it is important uh, how much it can cope with uh, uh, in the wild, for example, situation or uh, you test the, it just on uh, sequences like this one where it seems that the, the background and the, the, the the appearance of the people is uh, quite uh, constrained. So, yeah, currently we only uh, experimented on these simple data sets. Uh, but you're right that it, uh, that it probably won't function as well as in the wild. Uh, I think you would need a lot more context. I think you can't just directly do a frame to frame prediction for, you know, in the wild settings. So, yeah, for now we only uh, developed our method on the simple data sets. Okay, and so if you go to the next slide, uh, if I remember well, or, uh, please. Uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, next. Uh, next. Uh, like, uh, yes, here. Now, I was curious to know these timestamps, uh, uh, does it refer to seconds uh, or what, what does it mean, uh, timestamps? Uh, these are the Time steps, time steps in frames. Ah, in frames, okay. Yeah. Okay, time steps in frames.
Okay, okay. So I have no more questions. So. Any other question from the question, yeah. Okay, uh, I don't know if we uh, the all of the paper are here with us. I, I don't know. Otherwise, um, I have no news from them. So uh, maybe Stefano, now we can switch to the the. the the talk of um, Vira. Yes, and uh, okay. So uh, I have the pre-recorded uh, talk of uh, yes. Ira. So maybe you can. Yeah. I don't know more if you can introduce uh, Ira briefly, and then I can uh, um, present uh, or at least start uh, the video that. Uh, she sent to yeah, uh, uh, so she's uh, very sorry she cannot with uh, cannot be with us uh, uh, but uh, she pre-recorded you know um, the video so uh, Ira she's a professor at University of Washington and uh, she's doing her work on um, computer vision computer graphics deep learning um, virtual reality and um, she, uh, she serves um, as area chair and technical community of topper conference in com both computer vision, computer graphics, CVP, CGRAPH. So, and um, I think she's also uh, co-founder of many startup in computer vision and computer graphics. So, uh, uh, I can uh, thank you, Ira, for your talk. <laughs> and uh, yes, also, uh, yes, Ira said that uh, if you have any questions, since uh, he she he's not here, uh, you can uh, maybe send uh, the, the question by email to to Ira if you have any. So I start the, the video. Can you see the video? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm not glad. yet. No. My name is Erica. No, no. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me try again. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Sorry. Uh, um. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm uh, very happy to give this talk. My name is Ira Kalamacher Slitherman. I'm going to talk about the future of communication. Uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, three works from my team uh, that uh, we've been um, working on this year, uh, two related to video and one related to audio. I've been interested in the, um, uh, in the topic for several years now, but it became uh, even more urgent uh, this year where most of my time we spent communicating with people uh, in video calls or video conferencing. So my team and I would like to make it as um, a high quality as possible for uh, everyone. Uh, we don't see a video, uh, Stefano. Ah, sorry. Uh, let me try again. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, very happy to give this talk. My name is Ira Kalamacher Slitherman. I'm going to talk about the future of communication. Uh, Sorry, I don't know why. Uh, uh, okay, not so screen now. I'm oh, sorry. I'm very sorry. So I can you can. Uh, Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm uh, very happy to give this talk. My name is Ira Kalamacher Slitherman. I'm going to talk about the future of communication. Uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, three works from my team uh, that uh, we've been um, working on this year, uh, two related to video and one related to audio. 
I've been interested in the um, uh, in the topic for several years now, but it became uh, even more urgent uh, this year, where most of our time we spent communicating with people uh, in video calls or video conferencing. So my team and I would like to make it as um, a high quality as possible for uh, everyone. So let me start by uh, this video, which. Uh, um, uh, it's pretty hilarious, and um, that was before COVID times. Uh, but it's um, it's a serious uh, person, a professor, uh, talking about uh, North uh, Korea and the political situation uh, where that that surrounds it uh, with BBC News. But he's taking a call from his house. So if you haven't seen it before, um, you'll uh, uh, get ready for a treat. Let's watch it together. Scandals happen all the time. The question is how do democracy respond to those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shifting, shifting, shifting sands in the region. Do you think relations with the North may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. Funny. I'm sure that um, uh, in retrospect, uh, um, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a great video, but um, he would um, uh, possibly rather to not have the background scene while he's talking with BBC News. And, uh, you know, recently it's become more urgent. Our, our conversation happened in any place, in different apartments and so on. And so uh, people due to privacy or other reasons would rather remove their backgrounds because they're not very, um, you know, excited, and so or replace them um, uh, for something more appropriate, official, or whatever is uh, um, needed for the particular conversation. So this is a problem that uh, we uh, we've been working on, and you will say, yeah, but you know, like Zoom already has this um, a, a feature we can replace the background, like I'm doing it right now, um, and so uh, why can't we just use that? So here's a sample video that we've taken uh, using uh, Zoom's background replacement. And so Andre here um, is, uh, uh, is moving around and you can see all the artifacts that happen with the usual background replacement algorithm. So you can see problems in the hair area when hands are moving, uh, things are becoming blurrier. When uh, there is motion, um, uh, things are becoming uh, like more artifacts and so on. Check out the neck area and so on. So we would like to solve all of those and make it as high quality as possible. Remove all the artifacts. Um, and this paper is about that exactly. We call it background matting. Um, the world is your green screen. Um, and that appeared at CVPR 2020. The lead author is my postdoc Shumdeep and uh, Vivek uh, 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 Pusayaram uh, was, uh, uh, was working on this project as well, a PhD student in my lab. This collaboration with Brian Carlos and Steve Seitz. So let's see what it means. So uh, here's a direct comparison um, uh, of a similar frame captured with uh, Zoom's uh, back background uh, replacement and our algorithm, background matting. You can see that the artifact disappeared. Um, it's, um, look at the um, areas around the hand, look at the hair, uh, the hair strands and so on. So that, that looks pretty good. So how did we do that? And let's see a video version of that. Let's take a look at a few more examples. This is the captured video, and then here's our result. When I show our result, um, I show estimated alpha and foreground, where you talk about alpha if you're not familiar with the terms in physics. So given that we can estimate the foreground, which is the human, and the alpha, we can put any background behind her and uh, it will look real. So what is the, let's uh, let's lay, um, lay out these things of uh, different ways to solve this problem. So uh, the first one that I already mentioned that is similar to Zoom or um, 
uh, at least similar in some uh, in some way uh, is background subtraction it means that um, we're going to use features like color to be able to understand what is foreground what is background or motion perhaps and so on um, and that uh, typically creates um, artifacts because foreground and background colors coincide <coughs> or uh, motion coincides or things like that so that's not a, the best solution um, the other way to go about it is to use segmentation algorithms and in fact even uh, we have really good human um, uh, focused segmentation algorithms these days, uh, which can work, except that on the silhouette, when you look on the uh, outline of the person, you see all these little artifacts that make it look very synthetic. So it would be great to remove those. And the third way, and so the way to remove those is what is called matting. And so the idea, uh, uh, the idea is, and this is what we do, uh, a new algorithm to matting. And so the idea is the following, um, we are interested in estimating um, alpha, which is uh, denoted here as the um, green letter A in every pixel. This is a number between zero and one per pixel, such that when we multiply F is the foreground and B is the background. So when we multiply by foreground, this alpha, this is pairwise multiplication, and the background multiplied by one minus alpha, We'll get a, um, a nice uh, image that combines the background and the foreground, um, where alpha is the alpha map and foreground um, is the human, and these are the two that we would like to estimate because in the future we would like to replace the background. And so let's uh, uh, understand that for a second. So when a is equal to zero, we get just background. When a is equal to sorry, we get just uh, yeah background. When a is equal to one, we get just foreground. So that's the uh, definition. Uh, so let's look on comparison and video comparison of our method and background subtraction method. So at the bottom, you see the background subtraction and at the top, you see our method and composite. So you can uh, visually understand the artifacts that can appear. Here's a similar comparison with the segmentation. So it's much better uh, at uh, understanding where the foreground is, but still the silhouette and the outline is not as great. So matting is, of course, that's is a, this is a, a very uh, well-researched problem. And so we haven't invented matting. Typically, the way that um, people approach it is that given an image, uh, there is a manual trimop that is um, estimated. A trimop means uh, that it's separation to three things. Each pixel gets a label. Is it definite foreground, definite background, the blue ones, or it's unknown? And then the whole problem of matting is how to find the right A numbers for this green area, the unknown area, in a way that will um, create the best composite. For example, for hair, hair strands, you could imagine that A could be half or uh, some transparency to put it. All right, and the key idea um, uh, of our algorithm is, uh, is the following. So while we do not want to create uh, trimaps because they're created typically manually, if you want to get a high quality trimap, uh, and uh, it's just not possible to do it for every frame of the video, um, we can do the following thing. So we take a video of a person that we want to replace the background for, for that person. Uh, or when we take our own video, uh, our, like during video call, we can uh, take our own video. And then the second uh, thing that we do is we also capture the background. And now this doesn't have to be very aligned or accurate. As you can see, uh, Vivek here is using a handheld camera and the frame moves a little bit. So it's okay to have a little motions and um, uh, shakiness and so on uh, for our algorithm. So this is a setup. We have a background image and we have the person in that background. And then the algorithm goes in two steps. So step number one is a supervised learning part where we use pairwise, um, um, pairwise uh, we have pairs with ground truth. So uh, there is an Adobe Composition 1K data set that has 450 ground truth alpha maps that somebody labeled manually or perhaps with green screen composed into hundreds of random backgrounds. So we created this data set, and now we actually have the ground truth alpha map, and we have an image. And so we can run pairwise 
supervised learning that will allow us to estimate the new foreground and alpha map. So how do we do that? Given a frame, a background, and a segmentation, so this is a rough segmentation of the human, um, we build a context switching block, which um, is doing the following thing. It takes the frame, encodes it, it takes the background, encodes it, it takes the segmentation, encodes it. Background segmentation are used as prior. Then, um, then there is two selector blocks and the combinator block that combines everything together. And the idea is to effectively choose the input cues, which cues to use and which cues are not important. Given that, all that goes to red blocks um, and then decoded into a, a pair of images, which are foreground and alpha approximate alpha map. This alpha map is not great yet because we don't have a lot of data, pairwise data, um, and also there is no way of understanding if it looks, you know, realistic and good enough uh, just by uh, usual losses. And so our second step, which we found very effective, is to use GANs for refinement. And we do it in the following way. So we still have an input frame background segmentation. Now the green box is our step number one generator. So we can generate the alpha in the foreground. And then the yellow generator is the one that we're training right now. And so it generates um, it generates the foreground and background. We have the generator from step number one. There is a loss between the two. Then we combine and compose it with many different backgrounds. And we can have as many backgrounds as we want combine them together, and then we send it to discriminator and ask, is this real or fake? And so this way, the, uh, the network learns how to create real images that looks uh, uh, after real images after composition, which um, in consequence uh, creates good alpha mat and uh, foreground. So this concludes the algorithm. Let's see a few comparisons. Um, in the top row here, we saw the uh, difference, and you see the variation of the lighting and in the clothing and in the backgrounds and outside, inside, and so on. Um, the um, second row shows uh, our result after step one, uh, which is supervised learning, and you can see that some artifacts still exist, pretty rough. Uh, and then the bottom row shows ours after step two, which removes the artifacts and creates a hard quality results. All right, some comparison with state of the art. Uh, we compared to more or less all the work at a time. Um, and here's the short video showing um, those comparisons. So ours uh, is on the left top and the input is on the right top. Um, and the two and the uh, four methods that we compared to were at the bottom each. At the top right, right now we saw the, uh, the step one result. Here's another video. So those results are typical, and there's many more um, online. You can you can check it out. All right. Um, similarly, composing into a new background. Uh, which looks uh, pretty good. All right. Uh, some uh, uh, limitations of the algorithm. So here you see, uh, for example, in red here, you see when the motion of the background uh, the existing background uh, correlates with the motion of the person that raises the hand, for example, here, you will still see artifacts. We can get rid of those artifacts. So that's one limitation of the algorithm. Um, yeah, and these are more results uh, showing two people in the frame and um, uh, more complex hair scenarios. Uh, the context switching block uh, turns out to be pretty important in our algorithm. Here's a ablation study where uh, we see that without context switching at the middle row here, we see artifacts and missing uh, parts in the um, alpha map. The code is online and it's pretty popular, so feel free to check it out uh, online and uh, see more results and uh, try it out. The training and the inference code is online. Um, and, and people used it, uh, for example, Microsoft used it to create a virtual page for their build conferences. Um, 
conference this year and the, uh, uh, even the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, talked about our work in his CDPR keynote. So that was pretty exciting. And many more other uh, creative uh, ways of using the, uh, the code that um, appeared online. OK, some limitations that I, some of them I already mentioned. But a big one is that you know I'm talking about the future of video communication and so on. But um, uh, while the algorithm performs um, really well and state of the art, it is still not applicable to real time meeting. It's only eight frames per second or so. It also works on uh, uh, on pretty low resolution, five twelve by five twelve. Not very low, but lower than like HD and what we would like to have in high quality conversations. Uh, we obviously need a background capture in the beginning, which makes it a little tiny bit more challenging to use, although not a big deal. Um, shadows and reflections will create artifacts. We know that. Uh, big camera movement will create artifacts. So all of these things need to be solved. Um, and hopefully um, some of those will be solved in the next years. We in particular were really interested about the first part. So we wanted to create uh, a method that allows us to run real time and even in better quality than background medium applying to HD and even 4K resolution. And so this is the next work that we've been working on the last um, half a year or so. And um, uh, we built an algorithm can, that can go, can work in real time, high resolution uh, uh, made. This is work done by uh, students, uh, uh, Peter and uh, Peter here and Andre, and uh, 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 my postdoc uh, Shumdeep in cooperation advised by uh, Brian Curley, Steve Sides and myself. All right, so uh, the results are uh, pretty cool. So we were able to get 4K resolution at 30 frames per second and the HD resolution at 60 frames per second. And the quality is better than background menu. The input is still source. We still need the source and background image as before. Uh, and the estimates are, and the outputs are the same. We have alpha foreground and result. But you can see now, Details of details of the hairs are even better. Um, really fast sequences work even better than before, and it's all in real time. And Andre uh, and Peter even built a Zoom plugin. So you'll see that they use it uh, in their Zoom conversations right now, which is pretty exciting. Uh, here, Andre replaces his background and using it in Zoom. So currently it needs uh, GPU and works only on Linux, but we'll work on making it uh, more widely available. Here's a comparison to Zoom. Uh, ours is on the right. Here's a comparison to green screen. Uh, capture and DaVinci Resolve software, you can see that we are pretty comparable to, if not better sometimes, uh, to what green screen creates. Um, and so the idea is the following. We have two networks. We have a base network, which is a coarse network, and then we have a refinement network. Let's see how they work. So the input is a source and background, as before. Then the course network is responsible and created the, creating a course alpha and an error map. So this is the key in this algorithm. Now the error map pixels are only the ones that are sent to the refinement network, and the alpha in foreground is improved only on those patches. This makes it extremely fast. And then the final result combines uh, the new patches, the refined ones, and the old ones from the course network. So here's the course alpha and then the error map, and here's the refined alpha. Here's a comparison to previous uh, state of the art, which is background matting, uh, the paper that I described in the beginning. You can see that although it's pretty good with hair, it still created little artifacts when she moves, and there's a uh, re really thin strand, while the new work uh, improves over that. So background matting was um, a 7.8 FPS on 512 uh, by 512 resolution, this current network is uh, 33 FPS on 4K, 60 FPS on um, HD. And if we, uh, instead of, if we use instead of ResNet for future mobile net, we can even get to 100 frames per second uh, for HD resolution. 
check out the code uh, online. Uh, all the code inferencing training is out there. And feel free to use it. All right, so we talked about video, uh, where we, we were able to get a pretty uh, high quality mating for video uh, conversations. We got it to real time stage. It's still, um, you know, it's still uh, real time. It needs GPU and it's um, uh, a strong GPU. So we'll work on making it uh, real time on um, other machines, uh, but it's, it's very, very promising and already usable on machines with GPUs. Um, so, but how about audio? So a big part of a good video call is uh, a person's audio. We've all experienced, um, uh, you know, where audio cuts off and you can't hear the person or it's kind of noisy because there are people behind them, behind you, or you just don't want to, you, yeah, you want to separate your voice or the voice of the person that you're talking with from all the other noises that happen uh, out there. And so, um, Here's an example of uh, uh, Vivek, uh, my PhD student, that uh, uh, is trying to have a call in his house and his family keeps interrupting. <clears throat> I'm trying to do a video call right now, and one person in the house is using the blender, and another person is vacuuming right behind me. This is the kind of scenario which one might experience when trying to stay calls while working from home. And our goal here is really to see if we can separate out one speaker in order to provide a good video conferencing experience. And here's the output. So this is a recording test. I'm trying to do a video call right now, and one person in the house is using the blender, and another person is vacuuming right behind me. This is the kind of scenario which one might experience when trying to take calls while working from home. And our goal here is really to see if we can separate out one speaker in order to provide a good video conferencing experience. So you'll notice that the blender noise and the vacuuming noise disappeared, which is uh, uh, what we want. Uh, the VEX voice is still not perfect, uh, and uh, uh, we'll be working on that, but it is pretty, uh, at this point, the state of the art of what is possible. Uh, so we call this work the cone of silence. Um, this is an audio only work. There is no video cues that are used on this work. Um, and the idea is to do speech separation by localization. So we use the spatial um, uh, environment of the audio to help speech separation. Uh, this work is done by Tirapad um, on, oops, on the right here and uh, uh, Vivek uh, on the left here. Uh, equal contribution and advice by uh, Steve Sides and myself. It appears in Europe uh, 2020 as an oral. Uh, so why did we call it column of silence? Um, because um, because the algorithm is kind of doing column of silence, and it's uh, it's kind of doing like a cone in the in the space, as you'll see in a few seconds. Uh, but um, the idea came from my show from uh, uh, many years ago that that uh, it's called Get Smart. And they use something called kind of silence to create private conversations where they have only the two people that speak um, can only hear what they say when it's uh, secret or uh, needed only the two speakers to hear. It. So let's let's watch it for a second. It's pretty it's pretty funny. Point. Uh, so the point they have this device that you put on the two speakers and uh, uh, it didn't really work, but uh, uh, it was supposed to create a private conversation. So in our case, the method works. Uh, let me explain how. Um, okay, um, I showed in, in the beginning an example of uh, uh, a person sitting and people are vacuuming behind him and wondering so on as a background noise. Um, it also, the algorithm actually works with uh, uh, background noise or other speakers, um, uh, human voices. And so here's an example of input where four people are sitting and they talk simultaneously uh, or across like in pairs. And we would like to, uh, the algorithm uh, would like to separate uh, each speaker um, uh, so we'll hear what each speaker says. So here's the input. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. Orange versus red. Where do you stand on the whole orange? Orange versus red. 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 All right, that seems like a, a big mess. Um, uh, oh, so orange versus red. Here's the, um, here's the output. So, and what you see on the right here, this is the, so our algorithm is focused on separation by localization. Separation of the speakers, 
via uh, localizing where the speakers are located. And I'll talk about uh, how we capture this audio in a second. It is captured with the uh, microphone array. But let's look on the plot on the right. This is basically our, this is how we define our space in X, Y. Um, and, the, um, a, and the speakers are denoted by those little cones. Uh, and so each speaker is denoted by a cone and the direction where they're sitting. So, you, so two are in the top left quadrant, one is in the bottom right, and one is in the bottom uh, left, according to how the people are positioned around the microphone array. The microphone array sits in the middle of the table here. You'll see it in a second in a few slides. But let's see what the algorithm was able to create. So orange versus red, where do you stand on the whole orange versus red debate? No, I think that red definitely a better time. Okay. So you will notice that uh, Vivek's voice was able to be separated from the other voices and we could actually hear what he said. Now, uh, again, still artifacts exist, and so a lot of future work ahead of us, but it's um, but it's getting pretty well and we can actually understand what he says rather than the previous video where it was a total chaos. Okay, so, so, so the idea is the following. So our, we define our uh, problem um, as um, uh, as follows. So we assume that we have M microphones, uh, and this is by a physical microphone array that we put here in the system, in the center of the table. Uh, we have N speakers, and in this case, in this example on the right here, there are two speakers. Uh, and then we observe, in the previous example, it was four speakers uh, and so on. We observe audio mixture M. The M is a, a summation of all, all the audios of the speakers as I, plus some background. So background noise is included separately. And what we would like to do is recover speaker signals, S1 up to Sn. And we also want to recover their positions, which we define by their angular locations, theta1 until theta n. OK. Um, the advantages of our approach are uh, we allow unknown number of speakers, unlike uh, state of the art in this area, and they can be varying. Um, we do localization and separation at the same time, and they help each other. This, the speakers can move, as you'll see in some of the examples. Uh, we allow non-voice background sounds as well as um, multiple speakers, human voices, and we achieve state of the art results. So, how does it work? Um, on a high level, uh, so uh, there is a microarray in the center. This is this defines a zero zero position. Uh, the, the direction is defined by theta, and then there is a cone defined by uh, W. Uh, this we call <coughs> W is the angular window, and the theta is the target angle of the speaker where the speaker is located. And then we have a deep network, which is a separation network, uh, that given a space a theta and a W. It tries to understand uh, who uh, to separate the speakers in that area, uh, and they help each other. The way that the um, localization, so the separation network assumes that it's given theta and w, and the um, localization part is a binary search that subdivides the space to smaller and smaller parts where the separation network can run. Uh, so the um, separation network is based on. Uh, uh, wave uh, unit, um, it works in the waveform domain. I'm not going to go into details, but um, uh, the mixture, just on a high level, the mixture goes into a component. Let's talk about that in a second. A shifting component, then it goes into encoder or CM decoder with some skip connections, and um, it includes the window size and the target angle. Now, the shift is very important. The shift part is very important because, um, as um, uh, some of you know, when you have, we have two microphones, uh, and signal arrives to the microphones, uh, there might be time delay between the two uh, mics. And so we have to align them first to make sure that the uh, mixture uh, is, um, is uh, combined uh, correctly. And so that's how we, that's what we do. Uh, so this is the unaligned, um, uh, this is mic one, mic two, unaligned uh, combination, and this is the after shift. So we always do shift before we send the consideration. All right, um, 
let's see what it does. Um, uh, the combination of them, what, what it does, like localization on top of separation. So we begin by, so in this example, we have four sources. So source number one, two, three, four. You can see it on the left here. Let's listen to them. It's a it story. Was that yeah, again, better by by the over the following year. Okay, so this is a combination of four sources. Um, and initially, we divide the localization part. We divide the um, our space to four quadrants, and the separation network runs in each um, uh, quadrant. So it is able to find one. Here again, they would deny the voice. And then the second quadrant here still has a expected by October the following year. The purple and the blue uh, quadrants don't have any. Um, any noise, any audio at all. So uh, we remove it from further computation. Uh, we subdivide the quadrants again to now each each of them to uh, halves and keep keep running the separation network um, over smaller and smaller pieces until we uh, use non-max separation to understand where the uh, sources are. Uh, let's see a few other examples, and I invite you to go to the web page. We have many examples that the code and the um, and the paper, lots of explanations there. Okay, so let's see um, uh, a few more examples. Water, Water, blue. There's I mean, really so much plastic. Okay, in but the she ocean. doesn't think that blue is a good color. No, she she's not wearing blue. I'm not wearing blue. She's definitely wearing a better color. Green is a good color. Okay, let's forget about these guys and continue talking about it. Water, no, okay, so nature's color is green. Water is part of nature, and honestly, most water is green these days. All the lakes are polluted. I mean, really. Okay, but she doesn't think that blue is a good color. She's not wearing blue. I'm not wearing blue. Orange, these are orange. Orange pants, the best color of the ever. Orange, orange. There's definitely orange. Also, orange is fashion, and it's worse. But they're delicious. The oranges are great. I love the orange. So, orange versus red. Where do you stand on the whole orange versus red debate? No, I think that red is definitely a better color. Okay. They're better than apricots. They're better than plums. They're better than peaches. They're the best. I think. I, I don't think so. I think lemons are still the better one. So that was a very deep conversation. <laughs> Which one is better, red or orange? Uh, but I think it illustrates really well uh, the capabilities of the algorithm. So first of all, it works on real data and real conversation with uh, 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 many speakers unknown in advance. Um, and um, they, uh, and they all uh, talk in different voices and uh, different uh, uh, strengths and so on. Um, so that definitely makes it uh, uh, makes it very impressive. Uh, on the other hand, you can see also the limitations. Some of the voices uh, are a little noisy, and there's still uh, uh, quite a lot of work there. Okay, a few more examples. Here's another one with uh, a moving source. Modern One of the founders of the field of cognitive science and perhaps the most avidly read political theorist and commentator of modern linguistics. One of the founders of the field of cognitive science and perhaps the most avidly read political theorist and commentator. 16 hours right now. I have to wait until I work with her. Forty hours to wrap up another single. All right. Um, so this um, uh, summarizes my uh, my talk. I talked about um, high quality real time audio and video for uh, communication purposes, uh, for better video calls and other applications as well as in the speaker separation uh, scenario. Um, there is, I believe, we did really good progress, and there is uh, still a really uh, uh, several exciting ways to uh, improve those methods. And a food for thought here for the audience is what other components are missing? You're using video conferences every every day or so these days. Is there anything that you want? Um, perhaps you just want to, you'll figure something out and you'll solve it.
if you want to talk about any of that, uh, connect, collaborate, uh, feel free to contact me. Check out my webpage. It has, um, I talked about uh, this space of work that I'm excited about. I'm also working, my team is also working on um, um, uh, other exciting projects. So check out the webpage for the uh, different uh, new works um, out there. Uh, or feel free to uh, check out my Twitter and uh, send me a message on Twitter. That seems to work uh, the best these days. Um, thank you so much. And um, uh, uh, this concludes my talk. Bye. Okay, so this was the talk by, by Hira. So please feel free to send uh, her any comments, any questions about uh, uh, this interesting talk. So uh, are there the, the, the speaker of this second paper? The speaker of the uh, William Carver or Ifeoma Nvogu are there? No, it seems no. So, uh, Mohamed, are you there? Yes, I am here. Yes, okay. yes, I'm here. And uh, we are sorry for because um, we have no, no news from uh, the author of this paper. So, we are sorry for this. Um, so, in, if you have some question, we can ask uh, Ira about the last talk, and that she will be happy to, to answer to all your questions. Uh, and I would like to thank very much Ira for this nice talk. There are many ideas in this, uh, many things in this talk. So, maybe if we, uh, I would like also to thank all the speakers uh, about their talk. So, maybe if you have no if the speakers are not uh, here, maybe in this case, we can close uh, the, the workshop. Yes, I think so, yeah. Thank you for putting, thank you for organizing the workshop. I had a great time. Okay, thank you very much, Hoel. So Stefano, maybe we can close the workshop. Okay, so I will terminate uh, right now. Thank you, thank you very much. Maybe yes, next uh, next one. Huh? Bye bye. bye, -bye. Oh, we have a question. Sorry. Uh, Lucas, you have question? Please, uh, Lucas. Question? Oh, no question. I, I was just saying bye. Thank you for, for everything. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Bye, bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, Stefano.